concerns about equality or inequality are, are in the air. Um, I want to, I mean, what I'm proposing to do, Ant already made a significant foray into some of the issues um, that really are driven by the shape that the contemporary discussions have been taking about it. This talk is going to be a little bit more about its philosophical dimensions, and one of the things that challenges me a little bit in thinking about this, and uh, I'll challenge you as well, is exactly what the connection is between these two. Because as you'll see, the philosophical explorations of the significance of equality um, only touch on the stuff that's been coming up with Occupy Wall Street and, uh, and this, these, uh, the recent, uh, what is it, 1980 to 2007 numbers. Um, those things don't engage very much. So uh, I want to think more about why that is, and I encourage you guys to do that, and maybe we can explore a little bit of that in the discussions, uh, discussion time. So uh, the aim is to consider the extent to which um, we think that equality um, is a viable kind of social or political goal, right? Some kind of desirable value uh, which a society is better for implementing. So in that sense, a social or political ideal, what kind of ideal might there be if there is such an ideal? And what I'm going to do is look at um, a number of candidates that uh, philosophers and other social theorists have really pushed on hard um, and suggest that um, the avenues that uh, most are most prominently explored are not really very promising. Um, and I should say this, um, that I've been giving this talk for a number of years and as I've been doing it uh, over time, I think there's more and more philosophers that are accepting the conclusion that I'm pushing here, which is uh, there's some problems in the usual ways that uh, most people have been thinking about equality as a political ideal. Uh, so let's start with the first question, and this really, I think, is the question. That is, if we think that equality is going to be an ideal, uh, what kind of equality is it going to be? Because there's all di there's zillions of different ways in which we might think about people as being equal, or ways that people should be equal. One way would be factual equality, uh, and that is equality. What I'm calling factual or descriptive equality. That's that is equality in some kind of you know, biological or other kinds of natural traits. So imagine as a paradigm, right, suppose that you thought that the most important kind of equality was that people be all the same height, right? That would be a kind of factual equality. I don't know of anybody that's ever defended a view like that because, frankly, it would be kind of nutty. Uh, but there are lots of other dimensions, right? Thinking that people somehow are equal in intelligence is equivalent to thinking that somehow they're all equally tall. There's not. We're diverse in lots and lots of different ways. We're not all good, equally, dan equally good dancers, right? We're, we differ across the spectrum of physical traits, biological traits, anthropological traits, um, like any other species does. Um, and so the first point to make about this, is we better set this aside because this, isn't, this kind of equality isn't something we could realize even if we wanted to. So there's no point in thinking that this is some kind of ideal. And the second thing is it's absolutely unclear why we would care. Um, I mean, one of the things that really is great about other people is that they are different from us, and they're different in ways uh, that means that we're unequally gifted or abilitied in various different ways, and that's something to treasure about human life. Economists will tell you that's what uh, gives rise to comparative advantage and advantages through trade, and so we're better off for it materially as well. So we just want to dump the idea that we're talking about some kind of factual equality altogether. What we really feel most strongly about is what I'm going to call some kind of normative equality. And that's some kind of equality about how we treat each other, how we regard each other, right? And that, or how we ought to regard each other even more carefully. That's really the ballpark uh, that we want to be in. And the most plausible form, the one that sort of leaps to mind and it's the one that dominates conversations, is uh, some kind of equality of material condition. The, the idea that e uh, equality is an ideal is that there's some uh, form of the way that we ought to shape our lives together such that uh, people are equal in some kind of material way. Um, if you're reading the CBO study, right, the CBO study and uh, a lot of the numbers that the Occupy Wall Street people put out, they're focusing on income inequality. We're not actually going to talk about that because it turns out for some reasons that we can discuss, that doesn't seem actually to be very interesting as an ideal. 
the ideals, the ones that we're going to consider, have captured, I think, done a better job of capturing those intuitions, uh, but have run into, their own pro run into their own problems. And there are several sorts of equality of material condition that we need to think about. Uh, there are four that have received really sort of sustained uh, critical attention over the last, let's say, three to four decades. Um, the first is equality of welfare, or sometimes called equality of condition or equality of outcome, uh, which, well, I'll be exploring at least, uh, each of these in a little bit more detail in a minute, so I'll put that up. Equality of resources as an alternative, equality of opportunity as an alternative, uh, and equality of luck. And so what I'm going to do is go through these and try to bring out what it is about these ways of thinking about equality as a social ideal. All of them come, I think, from some kind of intuition, some kind of moral intuition that it'd be good for us to understand. I don't think it's the case that anybody who's um, defending these things is doing so just because they're on glue. Right? And if we think of them as being on glue, uh, we're going to disengage, I think, from serious moral concerns that people have and that they ought to have. So I endorse the concern uh, and I endorse the intuitions, but I think the intuitions are misleading. That's what I'm going to try to convey and suggest that the intuitions point in a different way. But the first thing is to understand what those moral intuitions are and then to see what the problems are with understanding those intuitions to point to these particular forms of material equality. The other point that's really important here is that these are all incompatible. And this is actually the engine that's driven uh, philosophical skepticism now about equality as an ideal. The problem is that we have to choose. We can't realize all of these forms of material equality. And once we think we have to choose between them and make people unequal along one of these other dimensions, uh, then you start getting a lot of infighting amongst actually some of equality's uh, most persistent sort of redistributist uh, progressive uh, defenders because they can't quite figure out um, which of these forms of material equality really matters. And I think that points to a deeper truth, as I'll try to explain. So what I'm going to do, so we've got these four different versions. What I'm going to do for each one, and this is pretty brief. Uh, I'm going to be pretty brief with this because I want to develop some other points, is quickly go through and try to capture what I think is the motivation for it and then highlight some of the problems for it. So this is, uh, I, I'm not representing this as a careful or cautious or knockdown treatment of any of these, I'm trying to give you a feel for where the debate has gone about these different uh, conceptions of equality. So we'll start with equality of welfare. And here the thought is, I think this is the thought that uh, is most plausibly ascribed to uh, people when they're worried about the 99% and the 1%. Or, um, People would look at the CBO numbers and are appalled at the changes in growth in, uh, in income over 30 years or what have you. And the idea is this. People are sort of by nature entitled to live equally well or have equally valuable or desirable lives. The thought, right, nobody is born deserving to have their life suck. That just seems right. I, you know, I find myself pretty attracted to that. Nobody is born uh, such that they deserve to have a life that is maybe much poorer, much worse uh, than the lives of other people uh, around them. So the problem, the first problem for this approach is measuring uh, how well off someone is. What is it to think that, how can we put some kind of um, quantitative measurement on how well off someone actually is? It turns out this is not an insignificant problem. Partly because we don't all think the same things make us better off. We differ with respect to what things make us better off. Let me give you an example. Suppose, uh, hypothetically, we have, uh, well, see, Ant was picking on Bill Gates. I'll pick on Steve Jobs, since he's no longer around to defend himself. Right, Steve Jobs and Mother Teresa. Uh, and imagine that you said to them, look, uh, you know, what we want is to make people the best off that we possibly can make it. Um, Steve Jobs thinks, and I'm going to be, I'm, I like Steve, I'm an Apple user, I'm, I'm going to be charitable to Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs thinks that a really great life is spent inventing cool stuff that other people want to buy or maybe stealing technology from other people, packaging it, marketing it in such a way that people really want to buy it. 
right? Pushing the boundaries of technology in various ways and making gobs and gobs of money. That's what makes Steve Jobs happy, right? You offer that life to Mother Teresa and Mother Teresa is going to say no thanks, right? I think what makes one well off is investing one's life in salvaging the lives of these poor women in Calcutta, right? You offer that alternative to Steve Jobs, he's going to say no thanks. Which of those is the appropriate measure of how well off one is, right? If we're trying to settle on a measure of material equality of us, which of those do we use? Or do we use some third one that neither Mother Teresa nor Steve Jobs would accept? Hard to sort that out. Here's one way that we can go about doing that, though. We say, yeah, forget it. It's not a matter of money. It's not a matter of access to you know, helping poor people as Mother Teresa did. What we want to do is think about what each person desires. Right? Because Steve Jobs wants one set of things, Mother Teresa wants another set of things. What we really want to do is make it so that each of them gets what's in their desired set as much uh, as possible. And so our measure of being well off will be how many of your desires for how you want your life to go get satisfied. Right? So that would be a way of, e of solving this measurement problem or solving this uh, quantitative problem. The problem with that is people want all kinds of things. Right? Some people want deaths of all the infidels on the face of the earth. Some people want all the Jews to go away. Right? Or they want all the blacks to be enslaved. Or they want all kinds of horrendous things. Do we really think that society has a burden on it to make them better off by making their desires satisfied? Some of the people's desires ought give us no reason whatsoever to try to satisfy them. And in fact, we have compelling reason to try to frustrate them. Other people, uh, and we know this about human beings, can cultivate expensive tastes. Right? Suppose that uh, Howie decides he's tired with economics, he loves art, and he's going, to, he's going to cultivate and cherish his taste for fine art to where all he wants to do is spend the rest of his life visiting art museums, the finest art museums on the face of the earth. Right? Now, there's some air travel involved with that. There's hotels and meals. Right? Howie's not going to be able to pay for any of that stuff because all he's going to be doing is standing in front of painting and sculpture all day. But if Howie succeeds in cultivating that taste to where he longs to be exposed to the world's greatest art, is it a burden on the rest of us that we have to gratify that desire, making him well off by making it so that he can stand to afford to stand in art museums all day long? That doesn't seem right either. Some desires, even if they're not evil, are not anything that's plausible to think that other people have to support. So there's problems in trying to sort out how we're going to measure uh, equality of welfare. A further point, what if we give somebody what they need to make their life go well and they squander it, right? This is sort of a caricature of addiction and addictive behaviors are a good example of this, right? Really serious addicts will squander anything that we throw at them. They were, are black holes for social resources and they're creating costs for other people that in a sense are endless. Is it really a social responsibility to try to, futilely, try to bring those people's lives up to the quality of other people's lives? That seems dubious, too. Seems to ignore the, the idea that people are, at least to some degree, responsible for most of the conditions or a lot of the conditions they're in in their lives. So all these problems, these, by the way, those objections are not coming from sort of hardcore classical liberal or free market types. Those objections are coming from other egalitarians. Uh, in this case, a egalitarian by the name of Ronald Dworkin, who's at NYU and uh, in Oxford and a, a legal philosopher, he says, all those, what those show is that equal condition is not a social ideal at all. It's not a, anything that we should aspire to. Instead, what we should do is aspire to equality of resources. And what Dworkin's thought is, somehow, and this is, Dworkin has some uh, technical ways of trying to do this. It's kind of a tricky idea, but in theory, the, the principle is good. We make sure that each person has access to an equally sized bundle of resources. And we sort of equip each person with this bundle of resources, and then we let them live their lives. And if they blow, if they take their resources to Atlantic City and blow it overnight, society is off the hook for the suckiness that their life is going to endure. They had their resources, and they chose to blow it on roulette, or they chose to drink it away, or what have you. It's a way of investing, seeing people as invested with responsibility for their own lives, and also as being able to make the choices about how they want to deploy those uh, in ways uh, that they will. Here's the problem with this. Um, that what counts as a resource is, I think, highly context-specific. 
Um, I think it was, uh, was it Howie that was mentioning, right, the problem of having uh, crude oil bubbling up in your landscape yesterday, right? That was a pestilential disease until somebody figured out how to make uh, petrol or, uh, kerosene out of it. At that point, it became a resource. Its status as a resource came about not because of its chemical properties, but because somebody figured out what to do with those chemical properties. And I think that's true for just about any resource you can name. So what's going to count as a resource depends not just on the stuff itself, but on what people do with it. And some people are going to be much better at turning stuff into resources than others. You could give me all the sand there is in the world. Right? It would not be a resource for me that it is for somebody who can do this. Right? Now, this is obviously not, this is maybe not Steve Jobs worthy, but I think that's pretty cool. Somebody has taken you know, a whole bunch of sand and turned it into this kind of interesting sand sculpture. That's cool, but I couldn't do that. That sand would just be wasted on me. It's not a resource for me. But what you can do then is you can say, here's what we'll do. We'll count as resources those variabilities that people have to take the stuff that's out there in the world and make it into resources. We'll count that too. Now the problem is resources aren't just stuff out there in the world that we're going to divide up. They're parts of us. And the intuitions that we have that we ought to be redistributing stuff so that people are equal, usually we're not comfortable with the idea that we're going to be redistributing parts of ourselves. But that's what these resources are now. The ability to use resources is part of us. And that seems a little bit dodgier. Okay, so here's a third plan. Forget about resources. Instead, let's try to equalize opportunities. And here, I think this is a pretty powerful and available intuition. People deserve to have a level playing field. Right? You start people off at a, at a given finish line, and then they race, and whoever does the best, God bless them. And if somebody comes in second, okay. If they don't finish, well, that's maybe kind of a problem, but at least we gave them a fighting chance at the outset. Now the problem is, it's another kind of measurement problem, how do we understand what's opportunity? Um, people want different things. People count different things as opportunities. Uh, the idea, if you tell me that I can go, uh, and work in the slums of Calcutta, uh, you may count that as giving me an opportunity. To me, it doesn't really seem so opportunistic. Uh, and it may not to Steve Jobs either. Uh, it may be that all of you have a wonderful opportunity to become florists. Uh, any of you guys want to become florists? Okay, so am I really somehow enriching you in some kind of way that really matters if I'm passing out free scholarships to florist school? Well, if you want to be a florist, that counts as a significant opportunity. For most of the rest of us, it doesn't. How, so what counts as an opportunity um, for us is a little bit difficult. And comparing the opportunities that people have is another problem. If one person can be uh, a bank teller or uh, play third base for the pirates, and another person can be a florist or a doctor or a classical musician, do they have equal opportunities? I don't know. I don't even know how to think about answering that question. It's not clear what having equal opportunities in that way would be. We could get out of that by counting options. We could say, we'll just count how many total available op options there are, however interesting or appealing they are to folks. Uh, but here's the problem with that. Once we're in the business of providing options, it looks like we've stopped worried, worrying about equality and we're starting to worry about liberty, starting to worry about things that are open to people to act on. So that's not so great. Luck egalitarianism, this is a relatively recent version. and um, it's not very well developed. But the idea is what we want to do is sort of equalize out the effects of luck on people's lives. So if someone is born with a crippling disease, they didn't deserve it, that's just sort of brute luck. And what we ought to do is somehow compensate them so that's equalized out for me. You know, I was born into a middle class, you know, being born in America, being born into a middle class family, being born into a middle class well-educated family, all of those are massive. They're lucky, right? I just lucked into that. Uh, what we want to do is find some way of uh, equalizing out that, that luck factor. The problem here is determining what's luck and what isn't. And that line is vague, and I think it's also a matter of opinion. Um, so we, what we do know is that if we export the costs of making bad decisions onto other people, that is, if we make mistakes of thinking that something is bad luck when it's really the result of bad decision making, we're going to have more and more bad luck and more and more bad consequences. I don't know if you can see from this picture, these guys are all kind of in hazmat suits. And this guy, uh, 
it just seems unclear on the program here of what they're doing. I'm thinking, you know, I have this because I just think, you know, I, I don't know what this guy's thinking, but whatever it is, it's bad, right? He needs not to be there or he needs to be wearing something different or something. I don't want to be on the hook when this guy has the bad luck to get some kind of disease, right? Uh, now, maybe he would say, you know, it was luck. You know, I don't know. I don't want to get in the business of trying to arbitrate whether that's luck or choice. This, admittedly, I think kind of tilts the question towards my side that this is just idiocy. But anyway, you see the, you see the issue. Okay, so just to power through these kind of superficially again, we've got what equality of welfare. The idea is equal opportunity for a good life. Uh, but we have problems of measurement and responsibility. We've got equality of resources, um, uh, where the idea is we want the equal materials to sort of make good lives for ourselves. Uh, but we have the problem that resources are made, not found, and we have different capabilities to use resources. Equality of opportunity, the idea of a level playing field appeals to most of us, I think. Uh, but we have problems of me measurements and comparison there. And equality of luck, the idea that bad luck is undeserved, and certainly some of it is. There's, I think there's just no arguing with that. Um, People do not deserve all the bad things that happen to them. Uh, but there's vague and contentious boundaries. It's not clear to me how we could proceed with policy on that basis. Okay, now I want to talk about some problems for all of these. All of these forms of egalitarianism split the questions of how we're going to distribute stuff and the questions for how we're going to get stuff in the first place. Right? And they treat those questions as independent, as though we the decisions that we make about how we're going to divide things have no bearing whatsoever on questions about how we're going to produce them. Uh, that seems to me to be uh, sort of colossally uh, bad, bad decision making because it takes people, it takes effort, it takes raw materials to make the things that we want to redistribute. And thinking that those two systems can just be uh, thought of as independent seems to me to be, uh, uh, obviously economists are going to say that's just completely harebrained and I think they're right. Another problem, I mentioned this in connection with uh, the specific criticism that Rawls had of equality of condition, but I think it's a general problem, and that's the question of really understanding um, the degree to which people are responsible for their lives and how they go. And I think this is a question that's not very well answered at the kind of macro level you need to be making social decisions. I think this is a question that really is a micro level decision that we make with each other in our interactions and our understandings of the choices that other people are making. Uh, part of what we want is we want not to be treated as though our lives are out of con our control. We want to be accountable, right? Many of you are much closer than I am to the time in your life when you were not held accountable for what you did, right? How many of you have fairly vivid memories of being treated like a child? Right? How many of you were really glad when you stopped being treated like a child, right? Now there's a downside to that. Right? The downside is that when you screw up, you're the one that has to make it good. Children don't have to do that. They have parents to make it good. Right? But most of us appreciate the idea that there's something really valuable about A, not being a child, and B, not being treated like a child. Most of us think that's an insult. To be treated as a child is an insult. And to be treated as a child is to be treated as though you are not genuinely accountable for what you do and the decisions you make. Accountability matters to us. It's, an, a real, I think, a really, imposing, uh, really important part of our lives. So we want to be accountable. We want to be held accountable. We want to hold others accountable for the choices that we make rather than uh, exporting our bad judgment on others. We're responsible not just for consuming stuff, but we're responsible for contributing to the lives of others. This is something these views don't do a good job of managing. Okay, and I touched on this point earlier. I want to reiterate it now. These it, this is really sort of philosophically as this research program, it, this research program has pretty much died in philosophy. Uh, the leading lights uh, in political philosophy that have really been pushing the egalitarian, uh, egalitarianism as a research program for the last 20 or 30 years are now saying it's dead ended. It's not going to go anywhere and we need to change gears. Uh, why are they doing that? Well, it's partly these problems. If we want to rea uh, realize equal outcomes, we have to arrange for unequal resources. We have to give people unequal opportunities, and we have to disregard luck. So if you're a material egalitarian, uh, a welfare egalitarian, and all the other people who believe in the other forms of equality are thinking, you're pernicious, right? You're as bad as those dang Republicans or what have you, right? Um, because, precisely because, they have a different measure of equal material equality that you are requiring that we violate in order to bring theirs about. 
Same thing for equal resources. If we give people e equal resources, we'll get unequal outcomes. We may well get a 99 and 1, one effect. I don't know. Maybe we'll get an 80-20 effect. It won't be equal. We know that because people use resources with different degrees of ability. Um, equal opportunities, same thing. We'll get unequal outcomes. How unequal? I don't know. We can't make it happen, so I don't have a test case to say. But we know with perfect reliability that the world in which we give people equal outcomes will not satisfy the egalitarian ideals of other kinds of material egalitarianism. The uh, neutralizing the effects of luck is so uh, vague, I'm not sure what to say about that. But I'm reasonably confident that's not going to come out well on the other dimensions either. It's just not that well developed. OK. I want to press this. What I think comes from this is the suspicion that material equality is actually uh, a bogus conception of equality. And I want to, so it's not just that we can't settle on one or the other as these. I think none of them actually have any credibility as moral values. That's a really strong claim. I'm going to try to substantiate it if I can uh, in the next few minutes. But part of what that means is understanding those driving moral intuitions. The intuitions that animate these forms of egalitarianism means understanding those intuitions in some way that doesn't say, gosh, we've got to go out and equalize people's welfare. Uh, so that's what I'm going to try to do. But I want to try to persuade, part of what I want to do is persuade you that really there's, there's no there there with the, this as a political ideal. So the first step, I think this is a crucially important first step, is to distinguish between having equal material wealth or equal resources or equal opportunities on the one hand and having enough, satisfying some minimum on the other. I'm leaving the idea of what that minimum is vague for now. Right? Uh, to make that point graphically, right, is the problem with these children that they don't have material equality? I submit that that's not the problem. The problem is they are starving. They do not have enough. What they need is more. They don't need equal. They need more or they will die. They don't need equal in order not to die. And a lot of our intuitions, I think, are driven by conflating those two, uh, two uh, kinds of intuitions, those two ideas. And the idea that it matters a lot that people have enough doesn't get us at all to the idea that people ought to have equal. Those are two distinct ideas that are run together very easily in the mind. I think once you pull them apart and you think, if I have to choose between people having equal and people having enough, I'm going for people having enough. And right off the bat, the idea that equality is what really matters drops off the table. Um, if everyone had what they need, if people weren't in dire straits, it's very hard to see why people would care about equality at all. And uh, so the concern that people have enough doesn't really get us to the idea that they should have equal. I should also add, if we all had equal and none of us had enough, equality would not seem like a very good idea either. If we're all starving together equally because we've made choices to have equal, uh, I would say we've made a wrong turn. I don't know if my battery's dying here or what. Um, I'll note here that in the classical liberal tra tradition, which has got a lot of variance in it, there are some pretty well-known classical liberals who make the case, and Hi I'm thinking Hayek and Locke, arguably, um, who explicitly make the case that um, part of the work of government, part of the, a political ideal, has to be a politically instituted social safety net, such that people have enough. So that's an argument that we can have. It, once we've decided, and my purpose is, let's get the idea of material equality off the table. If we're going to focus on making sure that people have enough, now we have an interesting and, I think, productive conversation about what kinds of institutions will make that happen. And that's a debate that classical liberals have been having a long time. But that's a different conversation that we can't get to if we're focused on material equality. Um, here things are worse. What if, or maybe this is bringing home the point that if we don't have enough, equality doesn't matter very much, a little bit more. What if equal distribution results in a smaller pie, results in less goods being available? If you are really committed to the supremacy of equality as a political ideal, you face an unfortunate choice. Um, you face the choice between defending that ideal at the expense of people having enough and giving up the idea that equality really matters. So to bring this home, let me 
sort of have you compare some, I, these are obviously not models of any particular society. This is a thought experiment. Imagine a society, you can think of this as being a society of four people, uh, or these are quartiles in a given society, and think about whatever measure of stuff you want to equalize, whether it's income or uh, condition or opportunities or whatever, right? And whatever units these are. We've got our four quartiles or our four people, and the stuff that we want to equalize is divided like this. If we compare society one and society two, I submit there's a natural thought that society two is in some way more desirable. Right? We've gotten rid of the inequalities that are there uh, between the first, fourth quartiles in society one. Here's the question. Are we going to prefer society two to society three? Because society two has equality over society three as well. Right? Society three has got the same inequality, roughly, I didn't get the numbers exactly right, it's got the same inequalities in society one. If equality is the issue, if equality is our guiding light, we have to prefer society two over society three. That's called leveling down. There are people who defend leveling down in some conditions. I think it's, I think most of us think that's not something decent human beings are willing to do to other people. Make others suffer so that they can be equal in condition with others. Uh, here again, we've got some smaller inequalities. Society five is better off on the equality scale, but it's also better off than society six, in which each person is better off than anyone is in society five. If equality is your ideal touchstone, if that's what makes your society a just society, a decent society, then you have to prefer society five to society six. And I submit that most of us are not going to sign up, that that's any kind of conception of decency or justice. Here, I think, is another element. So now what I'm trying to do is tease out the intuitions that I think are at work in the interest that these forms of material uh, equality have. One intuition that I think is at work is the idea that what's responsible for the inequalities that we see is some kind of injustice. Right? Um, the rich getting richer by making the poor poorer. Ant gave us some uh, empirical evidence that this is probably not the case, and I think that's right. But I want to make a conceptual point here, or a moral point. If we think that the story about why the inequalities that we see are because the rich are taking what rightfully belongs to the poor, then I think we're right, we have a legitimate moral beef. That's a reason for concern. But if they are taking what really belongs to other people, that in itself is a problem. The inequality is beside the point. They shouldn't be taking stuff that belongs to other people, whether it makes us more equal or makes us more unequal or anything else. The problem is they're taking stuff that by rights belongs to other people. So once again, the concern for equality is a red herring. It invites us to think about things that aren't really at the root of the moral problem. If people are taking stuff that genuinely is not by right theirs, then we ought to zero in on that, whatever the story about equality. right? So. Uh, if it's unjust for people to take by rights what belong uh, to anybody else, that's as true for the poor taking what belongs by right to the rich as it is for the rich taking by right what by rights belongs to the poor. The other thing is here, unless, uh, well, sorry, no, sorry, uh, unless we think that's at the, if we think that's at what's the, at the root of our concern about inequality, that's what we need to focus on, not the uh, inequality issue, and if we don't think that's the story that's going on, then we don't have this kind of injustice story that I'm saying uh, may be responsible for some of our intuitions. So I think, actually, once you start zeroing in on trying to think carefully about, this is the conclusion that a lot of philosophers are starting to reach, you th start thinking about what material equality comes to, it's very hard to see that it's of any value at all. And it's not just classical liberals or you know, right-wing sorts of uh, people that are saying this, this is what people on the left are saying. Uh, they can't make sense of it. It's certainly not the only value because obviously we have to care about people having enough. I don't know of anybody um, that denies that. It's not even the most important of social values. Uh, and if we have to start choosing, right, every time we find ourselves choosing something else that matters more than equality. So it, 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 I think it has a powerful intuitive effect on it until we start thinking about it. Once we start thinking about it, it loses ground, it loses power, I think, extremely quickly. So the moral of the story, if you bought these arguments, um, is that we should not accept the idea that material equality is very important. 
Um, that doesn't mean that no form of equality is out of the picture. And here, I want to come back and say that I like. I mean, I think equality is a really important human ideal. So it may not sound like it based on uh, what I've been saying so far, but that's because I think we've been talking about uh, sorts of equality that don't actually have very much of a claim on us or on our moral allegiance. That doesn't mean equality itself doesn't. And I want to talk for a few minutes here in conclusion about sort of a more promising way of thinking about equality that I think actually um, has significant potential, but we haven't thought about nearly as much as we need to. So I'm going to call this, my rubric for this kind of, this class of forms of equality, I'm going to call moral equality. Uh, but once again, this is a class and there's going to be a few species that I'm going to talk about within that class. The idea here is some form of equality in our relations with each other, some way that we see each other, or some way that we regard each other. And here I'm trying to pick up on some of those ideas that I mentioned earlier in connection with our ideas of being accountable to each other and holding each other accountable. We know that the way, the standing that we have in each other's lives is something that matters to us very, very deeply. I think that's really a, a key component of our moral lives and our moral attitudes. And what we're after now is trying to capture a way in which we can make sense of an equality in that domain of our lives that we're not going to get at by looking at the stuff we have, whether it's income or opportunities or condition or luck or anything. All those things are red herrings. And I'm, the arguments that I've given you are sort of my reasons for thinking, yeah, we should see them as red herrings. They're distractions. They get us away from what really matters. And this stuff is the stuff that matters. Now, what do I mean by moral equality? Because here, too, there's some varieties that we could consider. One kind is formal, uh, formal equality, and this actually goes all the way back to Aristotle. Aristotle says that uh, justice, one form of justice, consists in treating equals equally and in treating unequals unequally. Um, and I think what Aristotle says there uh, has a lot going for it. Uh, in fact, I don't know of anybody who doesn't think that Aristotle, what he says there, has a lot going for it. Nobody's going to argue with that. Right? What we're going to argue, start to argue about is what we should be looking at, uh, what features of us uh, make us equal in what respects, unequal in what respects. In other words, we're just going to recapitulate the entire argument that we've been giving so far. So the problem is formal equality is great. I think actually it's sort of a constraint on rational conduct. Uh, but it's, in other words, you're kind of irrational if you don't follow this. But that doesn't give us very much guidance because there's all kinds of ways of rationalizing treatment. So I think this is true but uninformative. Second, the rule of law. This has more teeth in it than formal equality does. Uh, and once again, probably if you walk up to me on the street and ask me if I believe in the rule of law, I will say yes. Uh, but I don't think either one of us will know what the other is talking about. Uh, this too is uh, an ideal that um, it's hard to figure out what exactly it comes to when you push on it. Hayek is, and I, I'm a, uh, an appreciator of Hayek. Uh, Hayek is a big, himself, is a big booster of the rule of law. A lot of people in the classical liberal tradition are uh, great defenders of the idea of the rule of law. The problem is that this idea, uh, too, is I mean, the principle is noble. And in fact, there are places that seem clearly to not to run afoul of the rule of law any place. Uh, but there are many cases where people will see themselves as advocates of the rule of law that seem to me to be nothing of the sort. Uh, and an example from, so I will kind of go political here, the idea that the president and a council of uh, his advisors um, can deprive an American citizen of their rights to due process, declare that they can be legally executed without any possibility of review by a court, any other procedural constraints, seems to me to be a fundamental violation of the rule of law. That is the rule of men not the rule of law, as that distinction has been propounded from time immemorial. But if you ask Obama, he'll tell you he's a believer in the rule of law. And it's not Obama. George Bush said exactly the same thing and on exactly the same grounds. Right? So once you have power, the rule of law seems to me, the law has given me power that I can execute however you like to. Uh, I don't think, I, I'm not sure exactly how to argue with that as a story about the rule of law. Because I'm not sure that I could do a better job of saying what the rule of law is, other than I don't like people like that having, I don't like any people having that kind of authority other, over other people's lives without being accountable for it in some kind of uh, rule-like way. Um,
But the point here is, I'm not sure, you, you can say you stand for the rule of law, but I'm not sure that really gets us very far, because it's been so watered down in so many ways. Um, Hayek, I, I want to touch on this, because Hayek makes an important point about all of these forms of what I'm calling moral equality, and all of those forms of material equality. Um, Hayek notes that no form of moral equality, this way of treating each other equally, is compatible with realizing equal outcomes on any of those measures. Moral equality and material equality are mutually incompatible. We have to violate one or the other. To keep people materially equal, some people have to have unequal moral standing over others. We'll, we'll return to this point. Uh, how many of you are familiar with Robert Nozick's Anarchy, State, and Utopia? Okay, so the infamous Wilt Chamberlain example in Anarchy, State, and Utopia makes this point, I think, brilliantly. If you want to make sure that people are equal, you're going to have to run their lives in a way um, that's incompatible with any kind of liberty. And that's the point that both Hayek and Nozick make. Uh, okay, uh, what I want to suggest is that the deep insight here is what we care about is this equality of authority. And I'll say more, a little bit more about that now and uh, more tomorrow in my talk tomorrow. Um, but this is, the way that I'm using this term, what I mean by this is our capacity to morally obligate each other. Um, this, I think, is a relatively unexplored form of moral equality. Um, and it's deserving of exploration because it's the sense in which it captures our accountability to our accountability, our accountability to each other is measured by the degree to which each of us, sort of as we are, imposes obligations on other people. And when they violate those obligations, they're accountable to us for doing so. Uh, this is a story that I want to develop. I'm going to develop at length tomorrow when we talk about rights. I think equality of authority is the best way for thinking about rights as well. So I'm going to kind of go into more detail on that tomorrow. Uh, but what we've done, what I've tried to do here is uh, animate the thought, first of all, that thinking about material equality is bogus as a significant political ideal. Uh, and it doesn't matter whether that's equality of welfare or equality of resources or equality of opportunity or equality of luck. Um, left the door open to some form of moral equality, um, perhaps this equality of authority. I, this is going to sound a little bit mystical, or maybe it'll sound a little bit, I mean, I haven't said very much about it, so I wouldn't be surprised if you weren't thinking, what the hell's it talking about? But I'll, so I'll try to make that a little bit clearer tomorrow. Mostly what I want to do is say, if we're going to think about equality, that's what we should be thinking about. And you're not going to get at that by looking at figures from the Congressional Budget Office. That's the wrong place to start thinking about it.